right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday night class. Good to have you here tonight and those online as well. Um, let's see, uh, give you one announcement. Um, uh, Mary Ellen Coates' daughter had her baby this morning. So Marissa had a, a baby girl. And uh, did anybody get the name, any name yet? Uh, Scarlett. Okay, Scarlett. So uh, congratulations to Marissa and Mary Ellen and also Brad as well, new granddaughter uh, and a new daughter in the family. So congratulations to them. Uh, other than that, nothing new to announce. Any other prayer requests or any other announcements at this point? All right, so we'll go off our list from Sunday, and we'll uh, continue to keep these things in prayer. All right, so let's begin then, as we normally do, with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1, nine, the rebound technique that doesn't share the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor, without which we cannot learn or understand the Word of God, nor walk in the light or fellowship with God. So if necessary, to adjust to the justice of God, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and now to glorify you through the study of your word. Father, we just thank you for all that you have done for us and our families, providing for our every need. We ask that you continue to provide for those needs in the coming days so that we continue to walk in your will and in your plan as we glorify you as we go about serving one another. And Father, this day we give thanks and prayer for the birth of uh, Marissa's baby Scarlett and uh, Mary Ellen and Brad's uh, new granddaughter. And we thank you, Father, for all going well there with that. We ask for uh, healing uh, for Marissa and also for the baby to continue to be healthy and strong in the coming days and continue to give them all joy and peace and happiness, uh, also through your word and through your spirit. We continue to pray and give thanks for Amy and her successful uh, double hip uh, replacement surgery this week. We ask that you continue to be with her and strengthen her in the coming days. Continue to pray for the Williams family and the loss of Andy this past uh, week uh, and uh, pray that you continue to be with Robin and give her strength in the coming days. We ask that you be with the Wenstrom family, uh, both uh, uh, Linda uh, DeSorio, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wenstrom's daughter, and also uh, Mrs. Wenstrom and her dementia that she is uh, struggling with, and also for Bill and uh, Bill Senior, Bill Junior, to be caring and treating for her. We pray for them and give them strength. We continue to pray for Steve and his healing recovery, and also for Sherry and her health issues. And Father, we continue to have a prayer for Judy and Larry, and we ask that you be with both of them and Give Judy strength as she endures this difficult time and also be with Larry and allow him to get the appropriate treatment according to your will. And we also pray for uh, Sarah and Billy who are trying to uh, ha uh, get pregnant. We pray that uh, that be successful and that they are uh, blessed by having a child. And also continue to be with Adam and Al and answer the uh, prayers for them, Father, uh, in uh, working their lives according to your will. So, Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have provided for us. We ask that you be with our service this evening. Have your hand upon each and every one of us, giving us concentration and not being distracted by the details of life, instead focusing on our relationship with you and the mind of your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, we learning his word. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. All right, and if Terry would like to come forward for our doxology. <coughs> And if you could all rise, please. <coughs> Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you very much, and please be seated. <coughs> All right, thank you, Terry, for the doxology. <coughs> now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. <coughs> And as we continue to note Luke chapter 6, we're noting the characteristics of being a disciple of our Lord called the great 
plain sermon of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in verses 17 through verse 49. Uh, our outline for this sermon is as such as I have it on the board. We've talked already in verses 20 through 26 about the blessings and the woes or the Beatitudes and the anti-Beatitudes. We just finished up on Sunday principles of loving, how we love our neighbor as we love ourselves and as Christ loved us in verses 27 through verse 36. Tonight we're going to note verses 37 uh, and uh, begin to note verse 37 through verse 45, which are principles on forgiving. And then we'll wrap it up by having principles on obeying in verses 46 through verse 49. But as I noted, tonight we're going to focus on that third portion, again, principles of forgiving. And as we have, we're going to note specifically tonight, verses 37 and 38, which we are seeing a transition from the principles of loving into the principles of forgiving. And in fact, when we talk about forgiving, the highest form of loving that you can express to somebody is forgive them for the sins that they have committed against you. And this forgiving is a fantastic part of the Christian way of life. And it's a forgiving when somebody does not ask for it nor repent from it. We are still forgiving them just as our sins have been forgiven at the cross of Jesus Christ, whether we ask for it or not. So uh, that is the principles that we're going to note. So let's read uh, in verses 37 and 38 specifically. And then we'll get uh, a little bit further. So as we have here... And uh, just to go back to uh, verse 35, it says, And love your enemies, do good, and lend. And that was the summary of what we noted prior. Expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is, un- uh, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as our Father is merciful. You see this, this ungrateful men and evil men, yet God's mercy and grace comes out to them and provides everything for them for their salvation. Whether they accept it or not is another thing. But we too should be providing everything for the forgiveness of other people, whether they accept it or not, that's, between, uh, that's up to them. Then in verse 36, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. All right, now verse 37. Here's our next section. It says, and do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. Go- uh, 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 given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So again, that's the beginning of the aspect of forgiving. As we understand, we ought to be forgiving our neighbor for any sins or trespasses that come against us. And again, sins that they've done directly against you, whether it be gossiping, maligning, slandering, lying, whether it be a physical or a some kind of verbal attack, whatever they've done to come up against you, we are to continue to express love on a consistent basis, and that love includes giving grace and mercy. And remember, grace and mercy are almost the two sides of the same coin, but mercy is more focused on the forgiveness of the sinner, even when they may not ask for it. So again, we see that uh, in the uh, great principles of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and loving one another as Christ has loved us. And as we note in John chapter 15, verse 12, this is my commandment that you have, though that you love one another just as I have loved you. And that's, then Jesus goes on to say, no greater love th- uh, than this, that one day lay down his life for his friends. Then he comes back in verse 17, this I command you, that you love one another. And the interesting aspect about this is that this was at the end of Jesus' ministry. This is part of that, what we call the Upper Room Discourse, which was the night of Passover. And he was saying this directly to what? The disciples that were with him, the 12 apostles, excluding now Judas Iscariot, who was going off to betray him. But then there were also, I'm sure, some other disciples, a lot of the great women that were there to help and support the ministry and were part of the ministry as well. So it was probably more than just the 12, but again, a small group of individuals 
individuals, but a group of individuals who had been with each other for about three years at this point in time. And over the three years, as we see throughout the Gospels, what do we see? We see different groups coming together, and we have a little bit of, you know, uh, 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 factions. You know, one group over here, another group over there, and we even see some argument between the different groups, and even some people accusing others of doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So we're seeing a lot of infighting, although it probably wasn't too great, but we do see some infighting amongst the disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So in his last parting message, what is he telling to do? Love one another. How do you do that? Well, by the principles that he's taught already. And these principles, now that what we have before us, going back here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6, are all principles on how to love one another as Christ has loved us. And forgiving is a major aspect of that. When you hold a grudge against somebody and you hold that into your heart again and have an unforgiving heart, it's no good for you and it's no good for the other individual either. And you're not going to be able to love them the way that God has designed you and wants you to love your neighbor or love your friends or love your acquaintances, whatever the case may be. Again, we can't have that unforgiving heart and think we're going forward in the plan of God. So as we have here in verse 36, we have the beginning of four principles of agape love that are really uh, in regard to the forgiveness that we are to have for one another. But we have four principles of this type of love. And in the first part of verse uh, tw- uh, 37, it says, "In do not judge and you will not be judged. <clears throat> So this is kind of all all of these, as you're going to see, you're probably familiar from the principle of you reap what you sow. And this is what we have before us kind of in a positive aspect. If we don't judge other people, we will not be judged ourselves. If we don't condemn people, we will not be condemned ourselves. If we forgive people, we will be forgiven too. So it's the positive aspects of the reap what you sow. But we also know on the flip side that the negative aspect is there, that if we do judge, condemn, or have an unforgiving heart, we are going to be judged, condemned, and unforgiven by God as we walk in our relationship with him. So, and then again, that invites what? Divine discipline from our Lord, which we don't want uh, at all costs. So, in any case, we're going to see the first three aspects of judging, condemning, and forgiving. And then in verse 38, we see the fourth principle of giving, which we've already noted in the previous verses as well. But our Lord brings it back around to us once again. So, what we have here is the parallel to what Matthew talks about in Matthew chapter 7, in verse verses 1 and 2, that also leads to the parallel that Luke then brings back to us in Luke chapter 6 in verses 41 and 42. So if we were to look at Matthew's, which we're not going to do right now, I'm going to show you those a little bit later on. But if we looked at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, it starts off with that, do not judge and you will not be judged. And then it drops down in Matthew, it goes right to what we have in Luke chapter 4. 6, verse 41 and 42. Let's read that. Now in verse uh, 41, it says, And why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take out the log, or take the log out, of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. So we're going to get to that uh, in due course, probably Thursday, maybe even Sunday. But ultimately, uh, in Matthew's gospel, it goes from this judging and it just drops right down to that parable about the log and the speck, which is a fantastic principle in regard to forgiving and also what we're seeing here of what? Judging. We should not go about judging our fellow brother and sister in a negative way. And that's what we, we have before us. And the first principle, do not judge. And remember, previously in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen that we are to have righteous judgment 
within our lives. It's okay to have discernment and to be able to discern between sin and righteousness or unholiness and holiness. You can discern within that. And you ought to then separate yourself from that. If you see sin and you recognize it clearly, you ought to separate from that, either physically, by not associating with those individuals, because you are going to get overwhelmed by their sin, or just do it mentally where you can still be with those individuals, but yet not sin. Now what we see here is another type of sinning where if we do associate with those sinners and we have the moral fortitude to not fall into their same type of sin, we also have to be cautious that we don't then get into a judging process where we start to call them out, not only in our mind of, oh, you're a bad person or you're this or you're that, but also now telling other people about it as well, where we get into gossiping, maligning, and slandering. So that's what we have before us in the first principle. We can have righteous judgment where we can discern between good and evil. But at the same time, when it says do not judge in this concept, it's talking about don't do it in a a, a vicious and an evil and in a wicked way. We are trying to run somebody down. You aren't to judge to tear people down. You are to judge to try to lift them up. As it says, as we're going to see here, before you go and try to take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of yours first. And then if you have no log in your eye, which means you're not walking in sin and you're walking in righteousness, you can then what? Help your brother by taking that little speck out of his eyes. And when it talks about speck, Again, you're not making what? A big deal about it. You're not making a big commotion about it. You're not running his name or her name through the streets and letting everybody else know about the speck that is in their eye. You see, this type of negative judging that we are commanded, again, using the imperative mood as we see it in the Greek language, is all about the unrighteous type of judgment where we're making petty evaluations about somebody or something and then ultimately trying to run them down. And this judging, too, can and cannot be, again, it includes both, whether it be true or something that is made up, okay? So unrighteous judgment, you could actually see somebody sinning, okay? But then be very careful about how you deal with the sin in that person's life and not judge them in a way where you're beating them down, running them down, or having, as I'm going to show you, uh, well, in the next slide, now I might as well put it up here, character assassination, okay? You don't want to destroy a person's reputation at all cost. Again, if there's a crime committed, yes, you can go to, you know, uh, you know, go to the police, go to the law, let's take care of the crime. If there's a sin within the church, there's righteous judgment where there is a such thing as church discipline when somebody is unrepentant of their ways, The church has a responsibility to discipline the people within their local assembly. So there is forms of righteous judgment. But we also have to be very careful that we don't jump immediately to character assassination where we're running somebody down, where it makes it difficult for them to do what? Associate with other people, especially you. You see, at all costs, as we've been talking and as I've been saying over the last two weeks, the cross is the number one thing. And if we are going to tear somebody down because of the judgmental attitude that we're throwing at them, ultimately it's going to make it difficult for us to give them the cross of Jesus Christ and witness to them the gospel message. Now, in context of all of this, what have we seen previously? The Pharisees doing what? And as I like to say, they were dogging Jesus Christ and his apostles everywhere they were going. And it's funny how, you know, we read in these passages, oh, they came from Judea, from Tyre, from Sidon, from, you know, Bethlehem, from Jerusalem. They came from all of Israel to see Jesus Christ. Well, we can talk about that in a positive realm, but we've also seen in Luke's gospel account in the negative realm where, again, these scribes and Pharisees were coming from all over to try to do what? Attack Jesus Christ and dog him and his disciples. And we've already seen them accusing and especially falsely accusing Jesus and his disciples of what? Wrongdoing and being what? Like the sinners and the tax gatherers. What were they doing? Judging them 
falsely or unrighteously. That's the type of thing that Jesus does not want us to do. He doesn't want you to get up onto your high religious horse and look down upon everybody else and look down your nose at everyone and think that you are much better than them and because of the sin that's in their life or the way that they're functioning or operating or they're not doing X, Y, and Z, you tear them down and you judge them. And call them out, especially publicly, where other people could have a negative attitude towards that individual. So again, we've got to be very careful about that. And we can judge righteously when there is occasion. But again, do that for your own sake to separate so that you don't enter into sin, either mentally or physically. But be very careful about calling that person out in the presence of others because it's going to have a detrimental effect on their opportunity and their ability to walk freely in society, in the church and outside the church as well. Or it's going to just create a schism between you and them where they're not going to want to hear from you the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're too high on your own religious horse. And again, we've seen many legalistic people over the years and throughout history, many legalistic people getting on their high horse, calling out everybody else, and ultimately trying to set themselves up on high. But yet it is just detrimental to the rest of the people. And therefore, they don't have the freedom to go forward to learn the Word of God. They don't have the privacy of the priesthood, to, you know, especially for new believers, to make mistakes and to fall into sin. Remember, when somebody comes to salvation, they immediately don't change their mode of operation and their behavior. There may be some slight change in their lifestyle, but they know nothing about the Word of God. And remember, they're still the same person that they used to be, but now they just have the new nature inside of them that can grow and be built. But until they grow and build, they're still the same person with the same type of personality and the same types of behaviors. So again, we've got to give privacy to the priesthood, give people an opportunity to grow and learn, and ultimately give them an opportunity to know Jesus Christ, especially as a believer. And also for the unbeliever, give them an opportunity to come to know who Jesus Christ is rather than running them down. And in fact... When you are witnessing, and you all should know this already, and I'm sure uh, you do, when you are witnessing, you really shouldn't be talking about personal sins at all, other than the fact that whatever sin you've ever committed, it is forgiven. And it doesn't matter what you've done, it is forgiven. And it's never about, you've done this sin, you've done that sin, you've got to correct this, you've got to correct that, you've got to change this, you've got to change that. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is he paid for their sin, and through him they have eternal life. That's it. And it doesn't matter where they came from and what they've done. So again, we see this type of judging, and typically from the legalistic, self-righteous, arrogant types of individual, where they're trying to character assassination through gossiping, maligning, and slandering. And if we do not judge others in that negative way, we too will have a clean reputation and not be judged ourselves. And that's a great thing. And you see, uh, again, this isn't a guarantee that somebody's going to come, not going to come along and because you're a Christian, run you down because you're a Christian. But what it will do, it, it will be that they won't, you won't give people an opportunity to call out your sin now. Because your sin of judging another and all that goes along with that now is a sin in your life. And again, if you're going to go around judging other people, somebody's going to come up and start to judge you too. And God tells us that if you do not judge your brother in that type of way, you too will not be judged. And ultimately, what does that mean? you uh, You won't have sin upon your soul. And you'll be protected and spared by God from other people now attacking you for being a self-righteous, legalistic, arrogant individual or being a sinner yourself. That is true, okay? Uh, But again, there could always be false accusations. We know that down the road. But basically, God will protect you. And at the same time, what do we also see? Because you won't have the sin in your life of judging your brother, you won't have God's divine discipline in your life 
You see, divine discipline, and we, uh, we'll uh, do a little piece on this after we get through all the principles and precepts, not tonight, but in the coming days, but we'll talk about divine discipline, okay? This is all about the avoidance of divine discipline. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. It's the avoidance of God's judgment to the believer, which is divine discipline coming into our lives because of the sin that we have. And if we are a habitual judger of others, Guess what? God's going to come around and try to, you know, give us the spanking that we deserve to get us to wake up and get us back into a right place so that we don't sin and we don't walk in the evil uh, that we are walking in. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 2, in the first part, do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. So Matthew adds that little part. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. That's what Luke says. And then he adds, which uh, again comes into play a little bit later in Luke's scripture, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And again, if you're going to judge somebody and call them a this, that, the other thing, God's going to come in and have to discipline you in your life. And ultimately, whatever you're judging someone else, you're going to get their discipline that God maybe was going to bring onto that individual. And instead of judging that individual, God's now going to judge you. Because you've done what? You've taken the place of God. You think you're God by judging that individual. Krino is the Greek word there, and it does mean to a, a, a judgment that is brought on to somebody. So again, it's basically a decision of guilt on your part in the life of somebody else. And who made you the judge of other people? Okay, as you know, I say it a little bit funny, you know, different way, but you know, who made you the boss of me? Okay, as we say, you're not the boss of me. Okay. Another way to say that, you're not the judge of me. The judge of you or every one of us, and the judge of me is who? Our Heavenly Father. So again, we should not judge. So ultimately, we don't get judged, and we don't receive the discipline that that person would otherwise potentially receive if they are walking in sin or the judgment that God will bring on to us uh, for falsely accusing them and the divine discipline uh, that God now will bring to us. Now, the second aspect that is also found in verse 37, it says, And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. And if you think about this, it's kind of taking us through the courtroom case, okay? Kind of the latter part. All right, the first part is the judging. And somebody's been judged that they are a sinner. Now that they are judged that they are a sinner, the next aspect, or a criminal, the next aspect would be what? The sentencing process. What does that individual deserve as a punishment for the penalty or crime that they've committed? And when we have the word uh, condemned, again, kata dikadzo, basically it does mean condemned, to find guilty, to pronounce a sentence against an individual. These two words somewhat do overlap, and it's not you know, uh, you know, completely cut and dry as to the two between a judge and condemn in the Greek language. But we can see the progression here. Again, a judging, you've committed a crime, you've been found guilty. Now that you've been found guilty, there's going to be a pronunciation of the sentence that that criminal now deserves. And that's the condemning part. So that is what we have to stay away from too. You see, because one sin will beget another. If you judge somebody as a sinner and you go and say, look at that person. No, they're doing this, that, and the other thing. And then after that, what's the next thing you're going to do? Well, they deserve to get what? God's discipline. Or they deserve to get this. Or they deserve to get that. And remember, the Pharisees were judging uh, the disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember when they were back in the grain field and they were picking the heads of grain and, uh, you know, doing the chaff and the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, separating the wheat from the chaff, the, the uh, winnowing and the cha chaff chaffing of it, okay, so they could have something to eat? They were getting judged. How dare you eat on the Sabbath, okay? And then later on, now they're uh, you're hanging around with the tax collectors uh, and the sinners at a party. Oh, you're tax collectors and sinners yourselves too. You see, they were getting judged. And as a result, you'd say that they're tax collectors and sinners. They were also doing what? Condemning them. Because the Pharisees knew what was coming for the sinner, according to the Bible. So again, when they were called tax collectors and sinners... Yes, we could say that's judging, but it was also the condemning part because full well they knew what the sinner would get. 
Those are people that are the people of God. Those are the people that will be going to the lake of fire. So by calling, calling Jesus and the disciples those things, they were taking the next step of then condemning those individuals. And again, we have to be very careful that we don't enter into the condemnation of other people. And again, if you stop it with judging, hopefully you don't continue on to the condemnation. But if you judge, right behind it typically is the condemnation that's going to come next. Again, we are not to unjustly convict others by passing a sentence on to them. And again, you know, even looking at the unbeliever and saying they deserve to be in the eternal lake of fire. Who are you to say that? You know, and I hate to use, you know, uh, like an Adolf Hitler. And, uh, you know, you know, we, I'll be very careful right now not to condemn myself. But it seems like, okay, but that's a somebody that we were all say, oh, that person should be in hell based on what they did. But everything they did, Jesus paid for at the cross. And if they would just believe in Jesus Christ, their sins would be forgiven. Again, hard to us to fathom from the human race, but ultimately uh, also uh, uh, hard to believe that that literally would happen in that person's life for the atrocities that they would commit. But again, we are not to be the ones that condemn other individuals. We aren't the judge, we aren't the jury, and certainly we are not the executioners of these people. And we can do that through our gossiping, our maligning, and even ostracizing them. You know, when we run somebody down and give, a, give them a bad name because of the gossip, maligning, and judging we've done, and then we ostracize that person, well, we're not going to hang around with them anymore. Or, you know, uh, uh, or we say such things so that people stay away from them, okay, in an unjust way and manner. Again, we've now condemned them, and we've set them aside. So again, we should not do that as we have brotherly love. We should always be looking for opportunity to have unity in the body of Christ and have an opportunity to witness to the unbeliever. And the fact is, as we see, if we do not condemn others, in the Greek it's very interesting because up until this point when it says do not, it just uses one Greek negative, may. But it, here when it says if you do not condemn, it says you will not be judged. It uses two Greek participles. It uses uk and may together, which happens every now and again in the New Testament. But when it does, it means you absolutely will not. It's like a double not not. Okay, and again in our English language, two negatives don't make a positive. Okay, as we know, but this one basically is two coming together to double emphasize what's going on. You absolutely will not be condemned. So again, if we're not judging others and then condemning them, sentencing them with all that uh, goes along with that sentence and the hurt that comes along with it as a result of running them down or doing something physical to those individuals, then we absolutely not will be condemned ourselves. So the positive aspects, we're going to avoid that too. We'll avoid God's judgment. And we'll avoid the discipline that now is crashing down into our lives that God would bring otherwise if we got into a system of condemnation. And as we saw in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, in the first part, it says, For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And remember the second ha half? By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. That goes directly with the condemnation that Luke talks about. By the standard of measure that you've given towards them, it will be measured to you. So again, whatever that might be, and again, you may you know, wish some evil onto your fellow neighbor because you don't like them or a fellow believer, and you know, maybe you wish to get in a car accident, or you, you know, maybe you'd wish uh, you know, their dog would run away or get hit by a car or something silly like that, okay? You know, people do stuff like that, all right? But whatever it is, okay? You see, whatever your standard of measure is to them, that will then come back around to you. And that's what we call God's discipline and the double compound divine discipline that can come into our life. And that is something we do not want to have a part of. Because again, God will first discipline us 
for the sin of condemnation that probably goes along with the sin of judging. And God may have to discipline us in our life. But then if we condemn somebody and we say, oh, they should get X, Y, and Z, guess what? Instead of God giving them X, Y, and Z, that's going to come back around to us. And the measure by which we condemn them, we will be condemned. The measure by which we judge, I'll go the standard as we have here, that will come back to us too. And again, it may not be a dog for a dog. Maybe you have a cat, okay? So maybe your cat gets run over by a car. Would you wish somebody else's dog gets run over a car or something like that? Again, however God wants to put that together, he knows what is best and what is most impactful to get us to wake up from our sinful state. So again, this all has to do with the avoidance of God having to discipline the believer within his life. And then we have the third aspect, which is forgiving or the pardoning. And as we have in the third part of verse 37, <coughs> it says, pardon and you will be pardoned. And again, that's the, uh, the uh, uh, New American Standard translation. Uh, the word is, uh, that we have here in the Greek is also, it's a apaluo, which we've seen before. And uh, luo means to loosen, but uh, apo it means uh, uh, away from or from, so it's like away from loosening. It means a binding, okay, when we talk about that. But again, pardoning and forgiving. Again, throwing away the sin that they've committed, loosening the sin that they've committed uh, against you. So forgiving and pardoning basically are part of the mandates that we have before us. And we have to forgive the sin that has been committed against us. And what's interesting about this one is that your judging and your condemnation could have been based on true facts, but many times it's based on made-up things, okay? Because of whatever reason, the, the sin that's going on in your life, you make stuff up about people and you judge them and you, you, you uh, inflate things or you overemphasize things, whatever the case. But this one, this one is actually when a real sin or trespass was committed against you. So again, the other two could have been made up stuff and you were just judging and condemning on made up stuff. But it could have been real stuff too. You've got to be careful in those realms as well. This one, they really did something against you. Because why do you have to forgive somebody if they didn't do anything against you, right? So to forgive somebody, to pardon somebody that has a debt against you, that means somehow, some way, they have harmed you. You see, the judging and condemning doesn't mean they've done anything to you. Maybe many times they don't even do anything to you. But this one, they've done something against you. And yet we still have the same precept. We need to forgive and forget. So that's what we have before us. Again, the condemnation, the judging, and ultimately uh, whatever else they might have done against us, any crime or sin that they've committed, we need to forgive of that sin. And this is when it gets really difficult within the spiritual life. Again, the first two, yeah, you can do that because they didn't do anything against you. Okay, Maybe they have in, in response or retaliation you judge and condemn out of anger and bitterness. Or maybe not. So it's easy to stop from doing those two things. Forgiving, <laughs> that's a whole other ballgame. Because now this person has done something against you. And this also goes back to the previous verses of forgiving of a debt. Maybe it's a loan. Maybe you let them borrow something. Maybe you gave them some money and they were to pay you back. And now they're unable to. So there's a harm that it's now caused you because now you're out of the money or you're out of the product that you loaned to them. Or maybe they just committed a sin against you. You see, we are commanded to forgive them and forgive them every time. Remember, you know, uh, uh, the apostle came, how much should I forgive my brother? Seven times. Should I do it seven times? Spiritual perfection? No. Seven times 70. It's 49 times within a short, you know, let's say a day, okay? <laughs> and that's a lot of sins committed against you. So again, we have to continue to forgive and then forget and not hold the trespass against us over the person or against the person. You see, if we're holding it within our soul, we're not forgiving, we're not forgetting. If we hold it over them and then treat them in a strange way or in a negative way, 
We're not forgiving them of their sin. Why? Because we're holding it on to our soul. Because we're more concerned about our feelings and that we've been hurt or somebody's done something against me than we are of the cross of Jesus Christ coming into that person's life. And as I said in verses 32 through 35, it even encompasses the financial debt that you uh, might incur or someone might incur against you that now they default on their loan or whatever the case may be. We also see this in Matthew chapter 6 and also in verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 27. In Matthew 6, 14, it says, If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. This is part of the template prayer called the Our Father in Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Then in Matthew chapter 18, verse 27, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion. Remember that parable I told you about where the king forgave the debt of one of his slaves and then the slave turned around and demanded the debt be paid from his fellow slave and then brought harm to him when he couldn't do it? And then the slave who was forgiven much was brought back to the king. It says, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. This was before that slave ultimately demanded payment from his fellow slave. But again, when there's a debt against us, we should have a forgiving attitude and a forgiving heart. Count it all as loss. Again, it was God's in the first place, and it continues to be God's. And it's God's problem and God's issue. And he'll deal with that issue, and he'll deal with that problem, how he would like to deal with it. And at the same time, as we're seeing within all of these passages, if you let God deal with it, you're going to get blessed so much more than if you tried to deal with it on your own. You see, when you forgive others, God will forgive you of your debt towards Him, especially experientially. You see, as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our sins have been paid for at the cross. And for salvation, our sins are not held against us. But for our, ex and that's what we call positional sanctification. But our daily walk is one where we continue to sin after our salvation. And God still requires us to do what? Confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, so that we are cleansed of all unrighteousness, any sin or evil that we've committed since we last checked in with God and confessed our sins. And you see, when we forgive others, then God will forgive us of our sins too. Now, how is that? How does that work? Well, what's the issue there? The issue is an unforgiving heart. You see, if you have an unforgiving heart and you don't forgive the sin of someone else against you and you don't forgive the debt of individuals against you and you hold it against them and you know, then act it out in whatever form or fashion of some kind of sin or evil back to that individual, when you have a heart of unforgiveness, you're doing what? You're carrying a sin around. And you can confess all of the sins all you want, but as soon as you stop confessing your sins, you still have what? An unforgiving heart. You still have a sin upon your soul. So you really haven't confessed your sin. Zzz. So you're not cleansed from all unrighteousness because you're holding on to that sin. And that's just like any other sin. If you think that you can name a sin and, uh, you know, you're committing some kind of sin, and you say, oh, that's wrong, I shouldn't do it, let me confess it, but I know right away I'm going to go back and do it again. That's not confession, okay? You see, there's a little thing called repentance that goes along with the rebound and recovery. The homo legeo, the confession of our sins. There's a little thing called repentance, which means you're changing your heart, changing your mode of operation. I don't want to be doing that sin anymore. I recognize it's wrong. I'm removing that from my lifestyle. I'm giving it over to God. I've named it to God. Now I'm moving on. You see, we go back to uh, David, and we understand when David finally you know, slept with Bathsheba and had that sin upon his soul. David went oh, about a whole year without confessing that sin. Went a whole year without confessing that sin. And that's why we get the Psalms where he said, you know, uh, you know, all my bones felt like they were about to fall apart. And I'm paraphrasing here. I felt sick. I felt ill. I felt horrible. It's like my life was going to be taken. 
And then he goes on to say, but when I confessed my sin, I had cleansing, I had renewal. You see, when he rebounded and recovered after that, it was about a year later, then God's renewal came into his life and his, con- uh, his cleansing came in. And what was the issue? He held on to his sin. See, his sin of not only adultery with Bathsheba, but his sin of murder of Bathsheba's husband. And he held on to that. And he never gave it over to God. He never rebounded and recovered. But once he did, then he felt the cleansing process and he felt the renewal of God within his life. So the same goes with us. If we go without forgiving individuals who have done something against us, we're holding on to a sin and truly we're never walking in the light of Jesus Christ because we have sin constantly upon our soul. That's why the Hatfields and McCoys, again, never came to a place of forgiveness because it was always revenge motivation. They never could forgive each other and just get along as the uh, story goes, okay? But in any case, that's what it's all about. And that's why, again, if you pardon or you forgive, you too will be forgiven. The flip side of that is if you don't forgive, you too will not be forgiven because you still have sin upon your soul. So as we've been understanding and noting, these are the three positive aspects of love in respect to reap what you sow. If you do not judge, you won't be judged. A positive thing. No discipline in your life. If you do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Positive thing. No discipline in your life. If you pardon or forgive, you too will be forgiven. In other words, you can confess your sins and have experiential cleansing for experiential sanctification. And you can now go forward in the light, filled with God the Holy Spirit, in fellowship with God positive aspects of reaping what you sow. And if you sow the positive aspects of the spiritual walk of not judging, condemning, and forgiving, you're going to reap the positive aspects of the spiritual life. You won't be judged, you won't be condemned, and you will be forgiven of other sins that you might commit in the name to God the Father. Now as we get into verse 38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. And I love this. Now we have four aspects or emphasis of the blessing that we're going to receive. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. They will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And notice that goes back to Matthew's gospel in verse 2 as well. So you see how the the, uh, two uh, vary but have the similar principles. And so what we have here is the law of reciprocity. And if you are a giver, then God will give to you and bless you in a fantastic way. And we have four emphasis of the type of blessing God will bring into our life. Now, the specific nature of this blessing is not identified. It doesn't mean you're going to get this, that, or the other thing. But God knows what's best for your life. And he will bless you in that realm. And not only in your life, but in eternity as well. And so if you have a heart of, uh, uh, of non-judgment, non-condemnation, uh, a pardoning or forgiving other individuals, which is all part of what? Giving. See, this is all giving. When you don't attack people, you're giving something to them instead. And what are you giving? I'm probably going to have this on a later slide, but I'll talk about it now. You're giving them what? Life. You're giving them welfare. You're giving them health. You see, when you judge and condemn and don't forgive, you're tearing people down. And it's detrimental to them what you're doing. But when you don't do those things, you're giving something. You're giving them great life, health, and welfare, because they're not worried and concerned or have agita, and they're not fighting and having their soul being all torn up with the stress that you're bringing into their life. You're actually giving them something. You're giving them freedom. Plus, you're giving them freedom to operate within society without worrying what this person thinks, what that person thinks, what they're saying, and what that's saying. And again, you know, when we talk about our day of technology and everybody's got a phone and we all have, you know, you know, digital things where we can communicate in, you know, a flash of a second. We can say anything we want. 
okay? And we think that, you know, we ha- there are no consequences of that. No, 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 there are consequences with God, okay? And, you know, uh, you know, especially, you know, the kids who haven't learned these principles yet, they get all puffed up, and they're pretty strong when they're behind the screen, okay? And they can say all kinds of nasty things and mean things when they're uh, tough things when they're behind the screen. Very different when you're face-to-face with somebody, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. But don't think that you're getting away with anything because God sees all and God knows all. And your judging and your condemnation and your unforgiving can be seen and is seen by God. And the bullying that goes on uh, in life is seen by God. But yet, if we don't do those things, we absolutely are going to be blessed by God. If we do those things, divine discipline. If we don't do those things, divine good production and blessing from God both in time and eternity. And this is more than just the monetary giving, what we have in view here. We're not talking about just giving of stuff, okay, and money. And even when we talk about our time, our talent, and our treasure, which we should be giving of those things and willingly as well. Everything that we've been talking about from verse 27 and all the way now through verse 37, even as we go back into, uh, you know, the previous examples that we've seen in chapter 6, all of that's in view. And all of that is part of what? Our giving. And whether it is a physical lending, which we are commanded to do, or whether it's just not gossiping about somebody, you're also giving especially when somebody has attacked you, and you may think you have every right to attack them back. By not attacking them back, you're giving them something. And you're really giving them love. And hopefully followed up by the cross of Jesus Christ. So again, it's more than just monetary. And this is a compliment to all that we've been talking about. That's why, again, it comes back around to the giving aspect. But it's not just monetary, it's everything. And when you have a positive mental attitude towards your fellow man, followed by the loving actions that we've been talking about that are a demonstration of your agape love towards others, that creates fellowship with you and others so that you can give the cross of Jesus Christ to people, you will actually give those people a good reputation. You'll give them help. You'll give them welfare. It'll be a blessing to them what you're able to do by giving them freedom and privacy of the priesthood. And again, going back to the log and the speck. Again, the new believer, they don't know all the sins yet. Okay? And we shouldn't run them down. They don't know the strength of the word yet. They don't know how to avoid sin as of yet. They may know a few things, but not much. So we've got to give them grace and give them the opportunity to grow give them health and welfare, and allow them to continue a good reputation. And again, just to throw out some political stuff to you right now, again, you know, our Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh once again got falsely accused of something that happened supposedly back in high school. What what was he, in his 50s now or late 40s, uh, early 50s? And if we're going to go back and hold everybody accountable as to what they did in high school, and condemn them for that, then we all should be condemned. (laughs) Because there's there's not one righteous, no, not one. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And again, our society is just built to condemn, 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 especially when they don't like somebody. Judge, condemn, not forgive. We see it over and over, and unfortunately our political system has turned into that. Because people can't win or or they don't like the outcome of a fair and square election, according to our Constitution, what do they do? They turn to dirty politics. They gossip, they malign, they judge, they slander, they condemn, and they don't forgive. And it's sad. It's a sad commentary on our overall society. Because those people in Washington are the people that our society put there. That's who we put there. They're a reflection of us as a whole. Not individual, but as a whole. It's a sad commentary. Hold on just a minute. I need to do something on my computer. All right. So in any case, when you give that individual freedom that to continue to operate, it's a blessing to them. 
And then God will give you that freedom too. He'll allow you to go forward and allow you to walk. And he'll uh, you know, uh, have avoidance of you may being torn down in certain situations. Or if somebody tries to come and attack you, God will deal with the situation and bring protection. And he'll give you the full armor of God so you can do what? Extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one, whatever they might be. You'll have the full armor of God, and it will be a blessing to you. So again, we give them freedom to function and operate so that ultimately they can go forward in the plan of God and not be harassed and not be torn down and, and uh, not be in a position where they never want to come to know Jesus Christ. And when we have a heart for giving, it results in tremendous rewards back to us both in time and eternity. And this is Old Testament, this is New Testament. God says if you bless other people and give to them however you want to give, many times giving is just not doing bad stuff to them, as we've been noting, again, God will bless you. Deuteronomy and in Proverbs. i got these verses for you here up on the board, Deuteronomy 15.10. It says, you shall, gener- uh, you shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertaking. And again, that's like, you know, he's addressing the person that typically would give and like, oh, why'd I do that? You know, oh, I wish I didn't do that. I could have used that money to go to the track this week and maybe win a thousand bucks or whatever the case may be. Or I could have gone out to dinner instead, you know, instead of giving it to that person. Oh, why'd I do that? Again, don't grieve. Because for the thing that you've done, the Lord will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. And again, God will bless you if you just let God bless you. Many times we're so busy trying to deal with our own junk that we're avoiding God's blessings every day. Because we're trying to take care of everything. Let God do it. And just have a heart of giving and forgiveness. In Proverbs 19, 17, it says, One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord. And he will repay him for his good deed. You see, when you're giving to somebody else who's in need, you're not giving to that person. You're giving to God. It's God's mode of operation to help that person. You're giving to God. And then God will bless you. Proverbs 22, 9, it says, He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. Again, don't you like uh, some of his food? He gave some of your food. That's generous. Because other people aren't giving any of their food. They're not helping the poor at all or those in need. They're keeping it all for themselves, for their perceived needs. And their, again, mostly it's keeping up with the Joneses, and that's why they're keeping their money. In Proverbs 28, 8, it says, He who increases his wealth by interest and usury gathers it for him who is gracious to the poor. And I love that. You know, the guy who thinks he's earning all this money, he's just earning it so that God can give it to somebody else that's going to use that money to give it to the poor. So he's really blessing the giver, and he's disciplining, in the sense, the one that is all uptight about his money. So as we see these four emphasis of the blessing that God will give to us, each one of these are in reciprocity to what we've done. Again, God blessing us for the good that we have done within our life. And let me give you the definition of these because, again, we can look at them literally and get a good understanding, but we get a little bit more emphasis when we look at uh, some of the Greek. And again, in your notes, I've given you the Greek, but not on the board here. But a good measure. Basically, this is the headline. You know, God's got the measuring rod or the measuring, you know, the the scale of balance or the the, the barrel that's going to measure whatever you're, uh, you know, putting into it, okay? God will judge what is right is what's in view here. There will be a good measure. It will be fair. It will be right. It will be just. You see, a good measure means it's not a false scale. It's a righteous scale. It's a good scale. And it will be appropriate. For whatever you're doing, it will be appropriate. And God will bless you in a very appropriate way. He will judge rightly, bless us based on how we are blessing others. Then when we look and can... Uh, uh, running out of uh, time a little bit, but uh, these are pretty quick to go through. When it talks about being pressed down, 
All right. So let's use, you know, grain. OK, you get a barrel of grain and you fill it up or you get a barrel and you fill it up with grain. OK. And you think you filled it up. But if you take some weights and you press it down, you're going to stuff everything down a little bit and then you can put more in. So there's more blessing that's in view there. Or if you're pressing wine, uh, uh, grapes or olives, what are you doing? You're pressing them out. And what comes out of that? The greater fruit and the blessing. You get the wine, you get the olive oil, the greater product. You get the better from it. And so when it talks about being pressed down, there's more and there's better than what you already have done to somebody else. That's what's in view. And again, when you take a stack of bills and you, you know, first put it up, you know, there's a little fluff and puff. You press it down. And if you wanted to stack and God said, I'm going to give you 10-inch high stack of bills, would you just want him to lay them out and let them all be fluffy? Or would you go, oh, wait a minute, God, you're not there yet. You press it down, you're going to get another doubling, maybe, of the bills that you could otherwise get. Okay? So again, we see the greater abundance. We see the better We see a better blessing and a greater blessing, the more abundance. Now, shaken together is a good one because, again, think of the barrel. Kind of the same thing as pressing. You put all the grain in the barrel and you shake it down, everything compacts, right? You can put more in, all right? But this shaking also means kind of you're mixing it all up. You're mixing different things and you're mixing the different parts together. And basically, when it talks about shaking together, yeah, it's talking about shaking it down, compacting it, getting more, but it's also saying it's going to come from all different places. And it's going to be different avenues. It's not just going to be one thing or from one individual. It's going to come from a lot of different places in various forms and fashions. You see, you might have blessed somebody in one way. God's then going to come back and bless you in many different ways as he knows what is best for you in your life. And not only in this life, but in the eternal state as well. So that shaken together has that concept. More plus a variety coming from different avenues where you never would have expected it to come from. Again, the grace of God. And then there's running over. And again, you fill up the barrel. You filled it up as much as you can. Guess what? God's going to say, you know what? The barrel, I'm going to give you more than the barrel. said I was going to give you this much. You know what? I'm going to give you even more than that. He's going to bless us even more in time, and then eternity as well. Again, the super abundant blessing. That's what's in view. So again, when we see these four aspects of a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, we combine them all, and we see the super abundant blessings that God will give to us when we walk in fellowship with Him. And we don't have these attacks on our fellow mankind of judging, condemning, and being unforgiving and not being cheapskates, and instead being giving individuals in our time, our talent, our treasures, in many different avenues and functions. Just being giving of the heart of our soul. Be giving of the loving attitude, the agape love that God has put in us. Give that to other people. And that goes back to, again, if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you've done what? Fulfilled the entire law. You've done it all. If you love You've done it all. You're not committing any of those Ten Commandment sins. You're not committing any of those verbal sins or overt sins. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're not doing the mental attitude sins either. When you love, you've you've done it all. And as a result, you will be blessed in fantastic ways. And then as we see, and I'll just introduce this and we'll pick up on uh, Thursday with this. But in the last half of verse 38, as it says, and we can just read that. And, and, and it says, they will pour into your lap, okay? That's another aspect of, you know, it's all going to come to you. And that, the word lap there really means bosom or your chest. But it's talking about an intimate relationship. That's what's in view there, you know. These things are going to be personal to you. It's going to be meaningful to you. And it says, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And that gets us back to the reap what you sow both negative and positive. If you sow negative, you're going to get negative. But as this scripture has been telling us, if we sow the positive, we will reap the positive. We will have the blessings of God within our life. Let me give you these two scriptures and we'll close. In Proverbs 11:24, there is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. There is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results in only want. 
And that's a sad commentary on many people because they're not givers. And then in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And that's the good measure, packed down, overflowing, super abundant, and all shaken together. Again, that's what God is trying to convey to us. Let's walk in fellowship, love our neighbor as Christ has loved us, and God is then able to bless us like we've never been blessed before. All right, so let's close in prayer. We'll, we'll come back on Thursday with more precepts. All right, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these great principles of blessing that you have for us. And Father, we just ask that we walk according to your will and plan and be better lovers of our fellow mankind so that ultimately the cross of Jesus Christ is preached and we glorify you on a consistent basis. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.